Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. Hi, my name is Cynthia and I'm a child of God and I'm here to share the gospel with you, which is the good news. And the good news is that Jesus came down from heaven. He left his throne. He was born to a virgin into a human body and he grew up and lived a sinless, perfect life. We needed a savior because we are all sinners and um, Jesus was the sacrifice for our sins. He willingly went to the cross where he was crucified and he rose from the, he rose from the grave three days later on the third day. He ascended into heaven and he is preparing a place for us um, and he will be coming back for us very soon to rapture us and to um, to begin his 1,000 year reign on earth um, at the end of the seven year tribulation. So how can you be saved? It's very simple. You just need to believe that Jesus died for your sins and that he rose again and that he's coming back. Um, he's alive and he's coming back. You confess your, you confess your, um, your sins to Jesus. You call on his name and you will be saved. You need to believe with, if you believe with all your heart and all your soul that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. Now, um, I am, I have done, I've, been doing research on another topic which I am hoping that I'll be able to get to pretty soon but this was a request from um, one of our commenters commentators um, asking that I um, talk about will Christians um, can Christians lose their salvation um, I have I have done a video on this previously um, it's about probably I it looked when I looked it up it looked like it was about six months ago um, and many of you are new and those were, um, I was just starting out when I was making those videos. So we're going to revisit this um, topic today. Um, a lot of people worry about, um, there's a lot of false doctrines out there. A lot of people out there saying, if you don't do this or that, then you're not saved. Um, but a true Christian who puts their faith and trust in Jesus you have, you will have, um, you have salvation forever till the end. Um, and we're going to talk about that now. So, um, in that, um, often quoted passage of the God, um, from the gospel of Matthew, Jesus reveals the horrifying news that some people will receive at the end of time. Unfortunately, these Bible verses get misapplied, um, whenever law and gospel are not properly distinguished from one another. When Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Now, when Jesus said this, he was not talking about Christians, about true believers. Um... These lost souls will point to their works as they plead their case to Jesus. Didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? Self-righteous people re rely upon their deeds to get into heaven. And sadly, they will be locked out for all eternity. Now notice when these people, um, notice what these people will not say to the king when they stand before him on judgment day. 2 Corinthians 5.10 um, Didn't we trust in you for salvation? Didn't we believe the good news of the gospel? Didn't we rely upon the blood you shed for us on the cross to wash away our sins? That's not what they're asking. Um, some people rely upon their works to get into heaven, 
while Christians rely upon Christ's death on the cross. People who are lost rely upon the law rather than the gospel. Um, all who rely on observing the law are under a curse. Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. Galatians 3, 10, um, 10 and 11. Um, every Christian is saved, redeemed, born again, forgiven, and justified on the front end of their relationship with God. Christians will spend eternity in heaven in spite of their imperfections on earth. Lost people live for sin, and their greatest sin is unbelief. Saved people live for Christ, while nevertheless falling short, um, far short of perfection. Some Christians demonstrate signs of spiritual immaturity, such as jealousy and quarreling. Um, see, Corinthians, see 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 4. But their immaturity does not disqualify them from entering heaven. Christians who doubt their salvation should be directed to the cross rather than to their efforts. Unless, of course, they are living in deliberate sin. In that case, they should be instructed to repent. For sin shall not be your master because you are not under law, but under grace. Romans 6, 14. No one under grace will hear these words from Jesus. Depart from me. No one under grace will be sent to hell to suffer eternal punishment. People under law do not rely upon Christ's blood for forgiveness for, of their sins. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews eleven six. Those who live in deliberate sin against God need to be presented with the law. The law was put in charge um, to lead us to Christ. Galatians three twenty four. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin. John fifteen eight. But that doesn't mean that they will lose their salvation. Um, it just means that the Holy Spirit's convicting you of your sin and you should repent and make it right um, because Jesus paid a high price for our salvation and um, you are saved until the end. We should respect um, what Jesus did for us on the cross. That doesn't mean you'll lose your salvation. Um, those who are genuinely sorry and willing to turn away from sin are ready to receive and appreciate the gospel. Um, the physical body of um, the physical body of every Christian is a temple of the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians six nineteen. The Holy Spirit does not dwell inside of unbelievers. Satan speaks words of condemnation to believers, whereas the Holy Spirit strengthens the faith of believers and assures them of their eternal home in heaven. Thankfully, Jesus is the author of our faith. Hebrews twelve two and not the author of our doubts. In Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Jesus describes professing Christians who are not justified. On judgment day, Jesus will tell these pretenders, I never knew you, depart from me. Jesus declares in Matthew 7 that only those who do the will of the Father will enter the kingdom of heaven. Does this mean that some followers of Christ are perfect in thought, word, or deed? Of course not. The process of a Christian becoming more like Christ is called sanctification, whereas justification takes place at the moment of conversion. Justification is not a process. It is a fixed reality in the life of a believer, similar to the foundation of a house. Um, it's a huge theological error to assume that a spiritually immature Christian is not born again and justified. God knows every heart. God knows who is saved and who remains lost in their sin. The law is designed to warn unbelievers as well as professing Christians who are pursuing sin. The comfort of the gospel, on the other hand, is reserved for contrite believers and for unbelievers who are willing to turn from sin. Matthew 7 should never be used as a sledgehammer to frighten spiritually immature believers or in some misguided attempt to squeeze a little more juice out of the orange. Christians bear fruit when they are faithfully and consistently fed God's word. When believers are motivated by the gospel and scripture, they respond to God's grace, um, to God's grace in faith and obedience. Christians do not grow up into spiritual maturity when their salvation is called into question simply because they are far from perfect. We will not be perfected until we get to heaven. Um, 
Scripture instructs believers to aim for perfection in 2 Corinthians 13, 11. And how do we do that? We do that by trusting in the perfect one who died in our place on the cross and seeking to please the Lord in everything we do. Justification occurs when the righteousness from God covers your sins the moment you are forgiven through faith in Christ alone. Romans 3.22 Sanctification involves seeking to live a righteous life as a believer, not in order to be justified, but because you have already been justified. So be encouraged um, if you are a Christian. Follow the leading of the Holy Spirit as you meditate upon Scripture every day and stand on God's promises even in the midst of your current imperfections. As you look forward to the day when the King of Kings will welcome you into the glorious and magnificent splendor of heaven, uh, Matthew 25, 21, um, and 23. So, recently I've been asked the question, can a Christian stray from the faith and still be a Christian? And the answer is no. Um... But um, no one can come. Um, scripture says that. All right, well, let's explain a little bit here. So um, Romans eleven seventeen says that some of God's people branches were broken off. Also, 1 Timothy 4, 1 talks about Christians departing from the faith. And 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 says some will fade away. 2 Peter 2.15 um, and 20 says that some have forsaken the right way. And Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 says that Christians who fall away cannot renew their faith. Um, it is a man's it is man's um, free choice to live and grow in Christ or to turn his back on him. I know that almost all of the scriptures um, are given as a warning to Christians that are in need to endure um, condition uh, to endure to remain remain saved. But the Bible says that um, John six sixty five, no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him um, from the Father. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. And John six thirty seven says, all that the Father gives me shall come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. So does in the scripture um, disagree with itself? Is it possible that Jesus can fail to keep people as Christians until the resurrection at the end of the world? Is it possible that people who once claimed to be Christians and then leave for another God were really Christians in the beginning? If so, that would contradict 1 John 2.19. Um, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm missing part of this. I'm gonna just, let me just grab my phone real quick. Um, my other phone. <laughs> okay. So, um, as you know, I already have, um, I have a page on Facebook as well, and it's called Walking with Jesus, um, Daily Devotions. And um, I'm just gonna, um, I'm just gonna um, go ahead and I feel like I had it. Um, I, I hadn't planned on this video; it was requested, um, so I'm kind of. But I did already um, post this on my Facebook page, Walking with Jesus Daily Devotions. Um, I already worked on this um, on there where I checked many scriptures and um, I think that I did a better job of explaining this. So I'm just going to pull up my my post from my my page. Um, and I think that this will this will answer those questions. So can a Christian be turned away from God? Can we lose our salvation? And the answer is no, absolutely not. God will never, ever abandon you or forsake you. 
He has promised us that if you believe that Jesus Christ is his son, that he came to earth as a baby, that he died on the cross for our sins, and that he rose again and will come back, that you will be saved. God does not lie. God does not break his promises. Um, now, I've seen many posts in various groups that say Christians will go to hell if, or you are not saved unless. How I mean, how many times have you guys seen this yourselves? Or if you don't do these works or follow this law, or if you sin, you will not be saved. Uh, the truth is that this is false teachings. Um, this is a lie to make Christians doubt the promises um, from God and question your faith. Because if you lose faith and think that your good deeds will save you, Satan can try to turn you away from God. Yes, you can choose to leave God. We all have free will. But God will never leave you. And that said, I just want to add, true believers will not leave God. It is so much more than just faith and belief to us. It is knowledge. We know God. Um, we see him in our lives. We talk to him. He is known to us. We do not just suddenly um, change our minds. We might have struggles and go off on our own, but he is our good shepherd. And if we are lost, he finds us. Christians do not go to hell. A popular scripture often used to spread fear um, in Christians is Matthew 7, 21, 23. Um, I mean, that's a very scary verse, huh? I mean, not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And that sounds so scary, but no. Jesus is not telling Christians who believe in him and who love him and are faithful to him to depart. He is talking to the pretenders, to those who say they are Christians, but they don't pray and they don't believe in Jesus. In their hearts, they believe that good works will get them in. They are not children of God. They just tell people they are, but they never knew him. Jesus knows his sheep and he can't be fooled. So what is the will of our Father? Well, in John 6, 28 through 29, um, then they said to him, what, was, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. And in John 6, 40, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. First, the term um, Christian must be defined. A Christian is not a person who has said a prayer or walked down an aisle or been raised in a Christian family. While each of these things can be a part of the Christian experience, um, it doesn't, it, it's not, um, it's not the way to, um, to heaven. It's not how you're saved. Hmm. Let's see here. So. <laughs> Sorry for the hold up here. Um, this is why I like to write all my things out, but. <sighs> Yeah, it's not what makes a Christian. Um, a Christian is a person who has fully, 100% trusted in Jesus Christ as the, um, the only Savior and therefore possesses the Holy Spirit. John 3.16, Acts 16.31, Ephesians 2.8-9. Um, so with this definition in mind, um, can a Christian lose salvation? It's a crucially important question. Um, Perhaps the best way to answer it is to examine what the Bible says occurs at salvation and to study what losing salvation would entail. 
A Christian is a new creation. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5.17 A Christian is not simply an improved um, version of a person. A Christian is an entirely new creature. He is in Christ. For a Christian to lose salvation, the new creation would have to be destroyed. A Christian is redeemed. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. 1 Peter 1, 18-19 The word redeemed refers to a purchase being made, a price being paid. We were purchased at the cost of Christ's death. For a Christian to lose salvation, God himself would have to revoke his purchase of the individual for whom he paid with, um, with the precious blood of Christ. A Christian is justified. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ in Romans 5.1. To justify is to, de- is to declare righteous. All those who receive Jesus as Savior are declared righteous by God. For a Christian to lose salvation, God would have to go back on his word and undeclare what he had previously declared. Those absolved of guilt would have to be tried again and found guilty. God would have to reverse the sentence handed down from the divine bench. <clears throat> um, a Christian is promised eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have eternal life. John 3, 16. Eternal life is the promise of spending forever in heaven with God. God promises, believe, and you will have eternal life. For a Christian to lose salvation, eternal life would have to be redefined. The Christian is promised to live forever. Does eternal not mean eternal? Um, A Christian is marked by God and sealed by the Spirit. You also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are in God's possession. To the praise of his glory, Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. At that moment of faith, the new Christian is marked and sealed with the Spirit who was promised to act as a deposit to guarantee the heavenly inheritance. The end result is that God's glory is praised. For a Christian to lose salvation, God would have to erase the mark, withdraw the spirit, cancel the deposit, break his promise, revoke the guarantee, keep the inheritance, and forego the praise and lessen his glory. A Christian is um, is guaranteed pure... uh, I'm sorry, a Christian is guaranteed glorification. Those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Romans 8.30 So according to Romans 5.1, justification is ours at the moment of faith. According to Romans 8.30, glorification comes with justification. All those whom God justifies are promised to be glorified. This promise will be fulfilled when Christians receive their perfect resurrection bodies in heaven. If a Christian can lose salvation, then Romans 8.30 is an error because God could not guarantee glorification for all those whom he predestines, calls, and justifies. A Christian cannot lose salvation. Most, if not all, of what the Bible says happens to us when we receive Christ would be invalidated um, if salvation could be lost. Salvation is the gift of God, and God's gifts are irreversible. Romans eleven twenty nine, a Christian cannot be unnewly created. The redeemed cannot be unpurchased. Eternal life cannot be temporary. God cannot renege on His word. Scripture says that God cannot lie. Titus one verse two. Two common objections to the belief that a Christian cannot lose salvation concern these experiential um, issues. One, what about Christians who live in a sinful, unrepentant lifestyle? And two, what about Christians who reject the faith and deny Christ? 
The problem with these objections is the assumption that everyone who calls himself a Christian has actually been born again. The Bible declares that a true Christian will not live in a state of continual unrepentant sin, 1 John 3, 6. The Bible also says that anyone who departs from the faith is demonstrating that he was never truly a Christian. 1 John 2, 19. He may have been religious. He may have put on a good show, but he was never born again by the power of God. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Matthew 7, 16. The redeemed of God belong to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. Romans 7, 4. Nothing can separate a child of God from the Father's love. Romans 8, 38 through 39. Nothing can remove a Christian from God's hand. John 10, 28 through 29. God guarantees eternal life and maintains the salvation he has given us. The good shepherd searches for the lost sheep, and when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulder and goes home. Luke 15, 5 through 6. The lamb is found, and the shepherd gladly bears the burden. Our Lord takes full responsibility for bringing the lost one safely home. Jude 24 through 25 further emphasizes the goodness and faithfulness of our Savior to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Um, you have been severed um, from Christ. Uh, I'm sorry. You have been severed from Christ you who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Galatians 5, 4. Fallen from grace, huh? That certainly sounds like they've lost their salvation, doesn't it? And the way the term is popular, um, popularly used today doesn't help either. Um, when we hear in the news about a celebrity who has fallen from grace, it typically describes someone who was behaving well but then suffered a moral um, a moral failure. Perhaps they were arrested for illegal drugs, cheated on their spouse, or cheated on their taxes. But in Galatians, falling from grace means something very different. Falling away from the message of God's grace and towards the law. Paul wrote Galatians to a variety of people. Some had accepted the gospel. Others were acquainted with the message, but hadn't accepted it. Still others had flirted with the idea of salvation by grace through faith, but instead chose to seek righteous, um, but instead chose to seek rightness with God through keeping the law. In Galatians 5, Paul was speaking to those seeking to be justified by law and notes that they were planning to receive circumcision. Clearly, this means that they were unbelievers who had no clue how to get right with God. How can we be certain that Paul was not speaking to believers um, who had lost their salvation? <coughs> Well, notice the contrast between you and we in the passage. You have been severe, severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. In Galatians 5, 4 through 5. The, um, the Greek word for severed here conveys that some of the Galatians were void of Christ. In other words, those who seek rightness with God through law keeping um, inevitably um, cut themselves off from the truth of the gospel. This makes it impossible for them to be justified before God. So this is not a group of believers who have lost salvation. Instead, it's a group of Galatians influenced and ultimately persuaded by Judaizers, um, Judaizers to mix Old Testament rule keeping in with the true salvation message. This is why Paul separates himself and his fellow believers, we, as those in Christ who approach rightness with God in a different way, by faith, not by the works of the law. Um, the New Testament is full of evidence that we cannot lose our salvation. Jesus said that the new life we have is eternal, not temporal, and we will never, and we will never die. Luke 20, 36, he said that no one can snatch us out of his hands. Uh, John 10, 28 through 29. Paul tells us that we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit 
in Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, and that our calling will never will never be revoked in Romans 11, 29. God will never leave us and never forsake us, Hebrews 13, 5. We are protected by his power, 1 Peter 1, 5. God is able to save us completely because he always lives to intercede for us in any sins imaginable, Hebrews 7, 25. Why did God so confidently say, I mean, I'm sorry, why did Jesus so confidently say that of everyone the Father has given him, he will not lose no one? John 6, 39. Because it's not our dedication, our commitment, and our promise keeping um, that maintains our salvation. No, the book of Hebrews actually reveals the polar opposite. It's God's promise to himself that secures our salvation. Hebrews 6, 13 through, and 20, 13 through 20, um, the author of Hebrews speaks of a promise secured between two unchangeable things that anchor our souls. What are those two unchangeable things? God and God. In the same way, God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. Hebrews 6, 17-19 It is impossible for God and God to lie. So when God promises God, you can count on it. And that's the whole point. Our salvation is anchored to a promise that God made to himself. Since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. Hebrews 6, 13. Some of our most frequent spiritual questions relate to the loss of salvation. But what if I die by suicide? But what if I get a divorce and then remarry? But what if I commit the same sin willfully over and over again? These four words pastor us, but what if? However, God already saw our concerns coming. He dealt with them entirely through the new covenant by anchoring us to a promise that he made to himself. We don't maintain or sustain any part of God's promise to himself. As believers who are forever in Christ, the but what if I questions do not have to plague us. We are not even in the, we're not even in the equation Instead of asking, but what if I, we need to be asking, but what if God? And the answer to that question is a resounding yes. God did the very thing he needed to do to secure us forever. He promised himself that he would never leave us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. 2 Timothy 2.13 God placed his spirit in us. He cannot disown himself, so he will never disown us. This was all part of God's perfect plan to secure us forever in Jesus. And it's the security in Jesus that inspires and motivates us to live uprightly. Titus 2, 11 through 12. So let's look at what the scriptures say. John 10, 28 through 29. And I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. 1 John 5, 13 These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Romans 5, 1 Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 31 through 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. How will he also, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, 
who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Hebrews 6, 18 through 20, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. John 3.3 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Second Thess- uh, Second Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come, or all things have become new. Hebrews 13.5 Make sure that your character is free from the love of money. Be in content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. 1 Peter 1, 5. Who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Um, Psalm 97, 10. Hate evil, you who love the Lord, who preserves the soul of his godly ones. He delivers them from the hands of the wicked. John 10, 28, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Hebrews 7, 25, therefore, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make interse- intercession for them. John 10, 29, my father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. John 6, 39. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing but raise him up on the last day. And I, there's so many more scriptures, so many more. Um, so many. I can't even um, get through all of them. There's just so many. So, Romans 8, 1 through 17. um, Therefore, let's, John 6, 28 through 29. Acts 26, 18. Romans 5, 2. John 6, 47. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Romans 3, 23. Romans 4.25, Romans 3.30, Galatians 3.14, Ephesians 1.13, 1 Corinthians 1.21, Romans 10.9. Um, there's so many. So, um, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, which gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. For um, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the faith, God did by sending his only son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Um, the the, The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by um the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's laws, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not um, belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. 
And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if the spirit, um, but if by the spirit you put the you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you received does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. <clears throat> Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed um, we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory, do not fear. Trust in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Remember, we are saved through faith by grace, and this is a gift from God. It wouldn't be much of a gift if he just snatched it away every time we messed up, now would it? Stand in faith, even when you're having the hardest time of your life. And that was Romans 8, 1 through 17, um, for the most part. Um, I should have said that um, at the end of the verse, which ended um, with, Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering, in order that we may also share in his glory. There's many people out there who um, want to bring us down, who want to say you're not saved. And you know who those people are? They're the Pharisees. The Pharisees who are out there saying, you know, closing the gates of heaven on people that God has opened wide, has, has opened for us. Um, so there's five signs of a hypocrite. Um, one is a hypocrite may be influenced by the gospel in every part of himself. He may come to great knowledge in God's truth, Hebrews 6, 4. His emotions about Christ might be high in Matthew 13, 20. He may even experience drastic changes in the outward man, like the Pharisee who prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, etc. Luke 18, 11 through 12. Um, a hypocrite is also uh, may also look to others like he's a true believer. He might talk of the law and gospel, Psalms 50, 16, openly confess his sins to his own shame, 1 Samuel 26, 21, and humble himself in sackcloth, 1 Kings 21, 27. He may even carefully consider what duties he needs to perform and seek after them, Isaiah 58, 2. Persevere even in hard times, give his possessions away to God and the saints, or even give his body away to be burned. 1 Corinthians 13, 3. That doesn't make him a true believer. None of these things do. Um, a hypocrite may advance far in God's ordinary graces. He may come under great convictions of sin, just as Judas did in Matthew 27, 3 through 5. He may tremble at the word of God, just as Felix did in Acts 24, 25. Rejoicing in receiving the truth, Matthew 13, 20, and have many experiences of tasting the good graces of God, Hebrews 6, 4. A hypocrite may have some characteristics very similar to the saving grace of the Holy Spirit. He may have a kind of faith like Simon Magus, who believed also in Acts 8, 13, but then proved to be a false believer. He may have a kind of legal and outward repentance that looks very much like true repentance, um, Malachi 3.14. He may even have a great um, and powerful fear of God, like Balaam did, Numbers 22.18. He may experience a kind of hope, in, like Job 8.13. The hypocrite may even have some love, as Herod had of John in um, Malachi 6.26, or Mark, Mark 6.26. Um, a hypocrite can even have a great and powerful experiences of God. He may even have tasted the heavenly gift and become partakers of the Holy Spirit and experience the powers of the age to come and yet not be genuinely converted. So what are the marks of a true believer? How genuine, um, how is genuine conversation to be distinguished from false conversion? Um, a true believer's heart is changed forever. 
In Jeremiah 32, 39, the Lord says, I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever. Hypocrites never have a changed nature. Hypocrites want Christ for the good that he might do them in the world, but a true believer's heart loves Christ as the all-satisfying treasure of this life and the next. A true believer changed, um, a true believer's changed life comes from a heart of love to Christ. Hypocrites can clean up their um, outward behavior to see, to be seen by men, to ease their troubled consciousnesses, um, or to keep themselves from the consequences of their sins. But true believers love Christ and keep his commandments for his sake, to serve him and to know him and to bring glory to his name, Psalms 119.6. A true believer seeks Christ and his kingdom above all else. This is the one thing necessary, Christ's friendship and fellowship. But that is never the one thing and heart-satisfying choice of the hypocrites. True believers, on the other hand, desire... Um, desire this better part would never be taken away from them. Luke 10, 42. Um, a true believer submits to the righteousness of God. Um, he abandons all hope in himself and in his own righteousness and rests wholly in the righteousness of Christ um, for his acceptance before God. A true believer rests in Christ and him only as his Savior. Hypocrites don't do this. Romans 10, 3. They depend in some degree upon their own righteousness. Um, and a true believer has three great essentials of genuine Christianity. First, he is broken in heart and emptied of his own righteousness so as to loathe himself, Luke 19.10. Second, he takes up Christ Jesus as the only treasure and jewel that can enrich and satisfy, Matthew 13.44. And third, he sincerely closes with Christ's whole yoke without exception, judging all his will just and good, holy and spiritual, Romans 7, 12. A hypocrite doesn't do any of these things. Um, and, you know, it's not our place to judge our brothers and sisters. It's not our place to be saying, you are a sinner. Um, you're not saved. You can't, you're not going to heaven. God knows everyone's heart. And a true believer... Um, will follow um, God's guidance, the guidance of um, the Holy Spirit. A true believer will turn away from evil and be repelled by evil. Um, but God knows each individual heart. He knows each individual struggle. And that's something that we don't know. And we have absolutely no um, place in shutting heaven's doors to anyone. That's not our place. God said that um, Jesus said that he would separate the tares from the wheat. Um, God, Jesus told Peter that, you know, he's going to make him fishers of men. He's together all kinds. Jesus can separate that, separate them later. Um, in Revelations, the uh, Bible talks about the separation of the sheep and the goats. It's not our job to do that. It's our job to plant seeds, to share the gospel, um, Yes, we can convict each other of sin. However, you need to be very careful with that um, because none of us are righteous, not one. Um, you need to be very careful with that. Um, we are to encourage each other, to be there for each other, but um, we don't get to determine who's saved. Jesus determines who's saved, and anyone who believes in Jesus is saved period um you know there's a battle of the mind going on right now <sighs> satan is at work um he's trying to spread doubt and fear and in these times that we're living in now it it's not hard for him to do so um for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringeth, um, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5 When Paul warned the Corinthians not to be ignorant 
of the devil's wiles. The Greek word for wiles means schemes and um, is from the same word used for mind. In other words, Satan's primary assaults occur in our, um, th in our thought life. The mind is the main battlefield in spiritual warfare. Every attack of Satan involves the human mind. Um, <sighs> this message focuses on the battle for the mind. It discusses the strategies of Satan and gives spiritual counter strategies for victory over his attacks. The battle for the mind is easily summarized. Um, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. But the carnal mind is en enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Romans 8, 6 through 7. Satan wants to make your mind carnal, sinful, worldly, fleshly. God wants you to be spiritually minded. Um, the greatest commandment includes loving God with all your mind. This is one of the main reasons why Satan battles for your mind. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and the greatest. Um, this is the first and great commandment. Matthew 22, 37 through 38. Satan battles for your mind because it is closely, closely tied spiritually to your heart and your mouth. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts. Matthew 15, 18 through 19. Um, Satan battles for your mind because the way you think affects the way you act. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. Satan knows if he can control your mind, he can control your body, your actions, and if left unchallenged, your spirit. In Old Testament times, fiery darts were used as weapons of warfare. They were um, hollow reeds filled with material which would burn easily. They were set on fire and then shot from bows. They were excellent weapons against the walled cities of the time because they could be shot over the walls to ignite the thatched roofs and the houses within. Um, in Ephesians 6, 11 through 17, Paul discusses the spiritual battle with Satan. He speaks of the fiery darts of the wicked. The enemy continuously hurls fiery darts um, at you in the spirit world. Most of these, dart, most of these darts are aimed at the mind. Um, the Apostle Paul warns that you should not be soon shaken in mind. 2 Thessalonians 2.2 2. In the Greek translation, shake means to agitate, disturb, topple, um, implying to destroy. Um, if you can take hold, of, um, take hold of something and shake it, you have control over it. Satan wants to shake or exert control over your mind. Um, the mind is one of the most complex and least understood parts of the human body because it is so complex. Satan um, has many subtle methods of attacking, um, though it would be impossible to list them all. Um, here's some of the things that uh, some of the tools that he uses to battle for your mind. Um, questioning the authority of God. The first temptation of man started in the mind. It started with this strategy. Um, when Satan said to Eve, yeah, hath God said, did God really say that you could not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Questioning God and his word leads to doubt, unbelief, and skepticism. Deception and seduction. Um, de deception was also a part of the enemy's strategy. When Satan confronted Eve, he was disguised as a beautiful serpent. Um, he was by no means unappealing as he is depicted in some artists' renditions. Satan uses lies, um, cults, and religious spirits to, rece um, to deceive millions in our world today. Some of these deceptions um, that Satan advances use um, several appeals, like you can become a god. You can know the future without the Holy Spirit. Your future, including eternity, is predestined. There's nothing you can do about it. There are more ways to heaven than just by Jesus. God is too good to send anyone to hell. And all God expects you to do is live a good life and do the best you can. 
the Bible should not be taken literally. And the Bible contains many errors. Even if you believe in Jesus, that doesn't mean that you're saved. Seducing spirits of Satan attack the mind to distort the truth of God's word. Now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, 1 Timothy 4.1. Satan used this attack on Jesus in Luke 4, 9 through 12. He tried to get Jesus to throw himself off of a high point of the temple since God had promised to give his angels charge over thee to keep thee and in their hands they shall bear thee up. Luke 4, 10, um, 10 through 11. <sighs> um, blinding the minds. Oh, the flesh. Let's not forget about the flesh. Um, Satan uses flesh to war against the mind. Um, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Romans 7, 23. Satan uses your own mouth, your ears, your eyes, and even your senses of touch and smell to foster wicked thoughts inside your mind. Um, and Satan works in the minds of unbelievers to blind them to the truth of the gospel. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of their glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. God also uses depression. To be depressed is to be downcast, sad, discouraged, or in low spirit. It includes feelings of despair, despondency, and dejection. Depression can lead to suicidal thoughts or actual suicide because of the hopeless feelings in um, which produces uncontrollable mental grief, sorrow, heartache, and crying. Sometimes Satan uses circumstances of life to lead to depression. For example, um, a great loss or a great loss or a fear of a loss, suppressed anger, low self concept. Um, low, low self-concept, unfulfilled expectations, and a negative attitude can all be used to cause depression. In Proverbs 24.10, we are warned about fainting in the day of adversary, troubled or distressed circumstances. Sometimes depression is caused by the negative attitudes of those around us through which Satan works. In Deuteronomy 1.28, God's people admitted our brethren have discouraged our hearts. We read in um, Numbers 21.4 that the soul of God's people um, was much discouraged. King David often reflected discouragement in his psalms. Um, see Psalm 69 for an example. The Apostle Paul also had times of deep depression. For we would not, brethren, have you be ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we pressed out of measure above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. 2 Corinthians 1, 8. If you do not conquer depression, it can also lead to oppression um, by satanic spirits. This is a deeper form of depression where Satan gains more restrictive power over the mind. Um, Satan also uses discouragement, um, which, of course, discouragement means to be without courage. Um, Satan wants to discourage you because if you are without courage, you are, an in you are ineffective in warfare. And withdrawal. Another way Satan attacks the mind is through withdrawal. The purpose of this strategy is to isolate you from the rest of the body of Christ. Since believers function together in ministry as a body, um, withdrawal makes you non-functional. Examples of men that um, men of God who were attacked mentally by Satan and withdrew are Elijah, 1 Kings 19, and Jonah, Jonah 4, 5 through 11. Uh, and a motive, um, a motive is your reason for doing something. Motives are important because although man looks on the outward appearance, actions, God looks at the heart. Um, so improper motives is another way that Satan uses to attack your mind. Um, but the Lord said unto Samuel, look, not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, 
but the Lord looketh on looketh on the heart. First Samuel sixteen seven. Um, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men, and and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. John two twenty four through twenty five. Many people enter Christian ministry for the wrong reasons. God is more concerned with motive than ministry. Um, this is where you should place your concern also. For when motives are proper, then ministry will naturally follow. Um, your motives for ministry might be right. Feed the flock of God which is among you. Um, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples um, and samples to the flock. 1 Peter 5, 2-3 You must enter the ministry willingly, not because of advantages or benefits um, of, the, of the title or office, not as a dictator, but as an example. Satan will try to create wrong motives for Christian service by putting them subtly in your mind. Satan causes wrong motives for desiring God's power. Um, you can find an example of this in Acts 8, 18-23 in the story of a man named Simon. Um, that was quite the story. It, I was fascinated with that story, and I still am. Um, it's very intriguing. So look up, um, read Acts 8, 18-23. Um, but you can have vindictive motives for your actions. Um, Vindictive means that you want to get even with someone who has done you wrong or who you don't like. Biblical examples include the disciples wanting to call down fire from heaven, Luke 9, 54, and Jonah, and Jonah wanting Nineveh destroyed in um, Jonah chapter 4. Um, David also had wrong motives in the numbering of the people. Satan, an adversary, stood up against Israel and stirred up David to number Israel. First Chronicles 21, 1 Chronicles 21.1 um, The wrong attitudes and emotions um, that Satan causes towards others. He inserts fiery darts of envy, jealousy, suspicion, unforgiveness, distrust, anger, hatred, intolerance, um, prejudice, competition, impatience, judging, criticism, covetousness, and selflessness selfishness. Um, he also tries to cause wrong attitudes of greed, disconsent, discontent, pride, vanity, ego, importance, arrogance, intellectualism, and self-righteousness. Wrong attitudes lead to wrong emotions and both stem from your thoughts. These attitudes and emotions render you ineffective in spiritual warfare. For example, James 4, 6 indicates that God resisteth the proud when you are filled with pride, you are actually arrayed in battle against God. Satan also inserts rebellious thoughts into your mind. Um, rebellion is willful disobedience against God's authority. Rebellion includes self-will, stubbornness, um, and disobedience. Um, remember that rebellion was the original sin of Satan. His five statements of I will demonstrated his rebellion in Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. The I will spirit is a way to recognize the operation of Satan through rebellion. And accusations and condemnation. Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. Revelations 12, 10. He sends fiery darts of accusation into your mind, makes you feel inferior and con condemns you. He will give you guilty feelings of shame, unworthiness, and embarrassment. One good way to tell the difference between the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the condemnation of Satan is to remember that Satan always generalizes. For example, he speaks in your mind like, you are no good. You can never live a Christian life. God couldn't love you because you are too great of a sinner. When the Holy Spirit is convicting you, it is specific. Um, for example, he brings you, he brings to your attention that you have a problem with anger or dishonesty or stealing. Um, Satan will also try to use sexual impurity 
Um, he'll insert thoughts with sexual impurity, lust, um, and mental sexual fantasies. Jesus said, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Matthew 5, 28. Um, Satan also likes to use confusion. Um, Satan also causes indecision, confusion, frustration in your mind. When you're confused, indecisive, or frustrated, you obviously cannot be a good Christian soldier. Tormenting thoughts... There's a whole category of tormenting thoughts that Satan sends into your mind, including worry, anxiety, dread, appreh apprehension, and nervousness. Mental torment um, can also come through an overactive mind that will not shut off or an underactive mind that cannot function properly. Tormenting thoughts also include fear. Paul speaks of the spirit of fear in 2 Timothy 1.7 and the fear of death in Hebrews 2.15. Tormenting thoughts also include bitter memories of events that should be forgiven and forgotten. Um, to compromise is to settle um, conflicting principles by adjustment. The principles of God and Satan are in op opposition. Um, Satan tries to get you to compromise and lower your spiritual princi principles. For example, he will tell you that it's not necessary to be so holy to believe the Bible literally, etc., um, today we see this happening all around us in the world today. We're being asked, we're, we're being told that we all worship the same God, but we don't. No, no, we don't. We're being told that a woman's body um, is her choice, what she does with it. And that's wonderful, but that baby is, a, the baby is, um, it, that it's its own separate body. Um, they're trying to make us um, compromise on our morals and ethics today. Satan is out there. He's working it. <sighs> and wrong mental focus. Satan will constantly try to get your focus on things of the world rather than things of eternal nature. That's another thing. Um, do not love or cherish the world or the things that are in the world if anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. 1 John 2.15 The cares of the world can actually cause the word of God to be ineffective in your life. Um, see the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke 8. Um, cares of the world can make you unaware of the short time before the return of Jesus. And there's so many things happening around us today. It's very distracting. As a Christian... We're told to watch, to know the signs, to watch, and to look up because our redemption draws near. And that's what I'm doing. I'm Jesus is coming to rapture us very soon. Um, and take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. Luke 21, 34. Satan will occupy your thoughts with materialism rather than with eternal values. Uh, read the parable of the rich fool in Luke 12, 16 through 21. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, um, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. 1 Timothy 6, 10. Paul warns that there are many who mind worldly things in Philippians 3, 18 through 19. Yeah, mental conditions. If you allow Satan to persist with thoughts of depression, suicide, torment, accusation, etc., um, it can lead to a mental illness. Um, this could include a nervous or mental breakdown and various medically recognized mental conditions. Satan can actually possess the mind of unbelievers and backsliders, those who have once known God, then turned away from him. He cannot possess a believer. <sighs> I mean, what an arsenal of weapons that Satan has targeted for the mind. Um, left unconquered, these thoughts lead to sinful actions. For example, hatred can lead to murder. Adulterous thoughts can lead to the act of adultery. Divorce starts in the mind. Covetousness can lead to stealing. Um, there is no doubt the greatest arena of spiritual warfare is the mind. Um, but don't fear. God has given some tremendous counter strategies for overcoming attacks on the mind. 
Let the Holy Spirit search your mind. Ask God to search your mind and reveal to you any wrong attitudes, motives, or thinking that the enemy may attack. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Psalms 139, 23 through 24. As the Holy Spirit reveals things to you, act upon the revelation. Ask for forgiveness for the wrong thought patterns and use the word of God to develop new thought patterns. Reprogram your mind with the word of God. And don't forget to use your spiritual armor. Two pieces of spiritual armor defend you from attacks in the mind. These are listed in Ephesians 6, 16 through 17. One piece of armor is the helmet of, ho of the hope of salvation. A helmet is worn on the head and implies protection to the mind. Paul is not only speaking of your present salvation in Jesus Christ, which can cleanse your mind, he is speaking of the future salvation. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Romans 13, 11. Salvation is also your hope for the future. The believer who has the helmet of salvation in place understands God is working out his eternal purpose of salvation. He is not disturbed by the attacks of the enemy. He has hope not only for the present, but for the future. The other piece of armor for mental protection is the shield of faith. As you've learned from biblical history, a shield was a piece of heavy material which a soldier held in front of himself to keep arrows from hitting him. The arrows bounced off the shield and fell harmlessly to the ground. The shield for the Christian soldier is called the shield of faith. The word faith not only refers to the basic truths of the Christian gospel, but to your confidence in God. Another piece of spiritual armor is the girdle of truth. Ephesians 6, 14. The truth of God's word will defeat any false accusations the enemy brings to your mind. And use God's sword. Um, in, in the temptation of Jesus, when Satan misused God's word, Jesus met the attack with the word of God. When Satan comes with accusations of guilt, use this scripture. Um, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Jesus Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Romans 8, 1. When Satan comes with torment, um, tormenting feelings such as fear, um, use these scriptures. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. 1 John 4, 18. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1, 7. When Satan tries to discourage you, um, use this verse. Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. Be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Joshua 1, 9. When Satan brings false guilt to your mind, remember if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Satan wants to... He wants to discourage you. And um, we can't... We are children of God. You don't have to worry about anything. You are saved to the end. To the day of... To the end. There is no condemnation in us. We are children of God and we are absolutely forgiven of all of our sins, past, present, and future. It doesn't matter. If you truly believe in Jesus, you are saved. And that's it. Um, don't let anybody try to take your joy from you. Don't let them take your joy. Jesus is coming soon. We are looking up. We are waiting for his return. Um, we are occupying this sinful world, and Satan's already lost. Um, can you feel it? Can you feel the energy, the Antichrist spirit in this world? Uh, um, I, if you look around, you watch the news, I mean, the Grammys, my gosh. Um, very satanic. Um, 
going on there very recently, but we don't have to worry about any of it because Jesus loves us. We are not appointed to wrath and we are saved. Even if you don't believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, guess what? You're still going to be raptured. Um, it's not a salvational issue. Um, the people who point fingers at you and say you're not saved because you do this, this, and this. Again, this is not a salvational issue. Um, for those of us who are born and believe in Jesus, we're saved, sanctified, sealed to the end. And if you um, don't believe in Jesus, if you don't believe that he died on the cross, I very strongly implore you, um, if you don't believe that he rose from the dead three days later, seek after God, ask God to show you the truth because time's running out. He's coming back very soon and I want to see you in heaven. 